हाय शगन
Hello everyone. We would like to mention, we would like to thank Puna Ma'am for joining. Uh, Mr. Montek Singh Alwalia will be back in a while.
Hello? Hello? Good evening. Good evening, sir. Have we heard? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. So tell me, what do we want to do? So uh, I think we can start now after Pranav gives the introduction speech. So you want me to speak for about what, 20 minutes and then, I mean, it's much nicer to have questions, but uh, I'll be dealing with things different from what's on top of your mind. So let me, let me give a brief introduction of the issues and then uh, throw it open to, to, for questions, okay? All right, so ready to start whenever you are. Yes, sir. Uh, Pranav, I would like to hand over to Pranav for the introduction message. And then, sir, after that, the stage is yours. Good evening, all, and uh, welcome to the Economic Society's edition of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, commemorating the 75th year of India's independence. In a time when the world is facing the dual crisis posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, what lies ahead of us for the next 20 years is fraught with uncertainty. It certainly warrants discussion and debate amongst all. This evening, it is our pri privilege to host Dr. Montek Singh Aluvalia to enlighten us all on the economic challenges we are due to face in the next 20 years. Good evening, sir, and welcome to St. Stephen's College Google Meet edition. Uh, we are delighted to host you for this event and are very grateful that you could take out time to address us in this august gathering. We are proud to say that Sir is himself a St. Stephen's College alumnus, following which he went on to Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar to obtain an MA in Philosophy, Politics and Economics, where he also presided over the Oxford Union. He further obtained an MPhil from Oxford. Sir then went on to work in a host of organizations and settings making himself a key figure in the Indian economic reform process, including the shift to a liberalized Indian economy. He was the former deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India and the first director of the Independent Evaluation Office at the International Monetary Fund. He was also a distinguished fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress and a member of the high-level advisory group formed by the World Bank and the IMF in face of the current economic crisis. Sir was conferred the Padma Vibhushan by the President of India for his exemplary public service, as well as has received several honorary degrees from the University of Oxford and IIT Roorkee. We welcome you, sir, to this gathering. Without further ado, I'll pass on the mic to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be addressing a society of which I was a member half a million years ago. Uh, I don't think that you guys uh, probably can have a sense of how different the world was in that long period. So it's useful to reflect on that because uh, when you are kind of roughly my age, which is about 78, you should look ahead and see that if the world is going to be as different uh, then as it has been for me over this period, 
then quite honestly, a lot of the things that we are currently worrying about are going to look very different as uh, the future unfolds. So, you know, it's, it's tough to uh, summarize everything. So let me start by producing a bit of an advertisement uh, for my book, because I wanted to write down my experiences with economic policy, which might be of interest to young students looking at policy making today and for the future. I don't know how many of you are either aware of or have seen it or have read it, uh, but in order to make sure that A, you're aware, and B, you can see it, I think I'm just going to hold it up so that you can see that it looks like a moderately nice book. And I strongly recommend that you either get it from your library or just order it from Amazon and read about economic policy changes in the past, whatever, 30, 30 40 years. Now, looking ahead, <clears throat> you know, uh, in introducing me, uh, it was said that, well, we are facing new challenges like the pandemic and climate change. Uh, I would say that we can a little bit uh, expand the range of those challenges. It's not just the pandemic and it's not just climate change. Both are important challenges. But actually what we are seeing right now, in the short run, from the economic point of view, we're still battling the pandemic. Maybe with a bit of luck, maybe we are coming to a period when people think that, you know, we can live with the, with the, way, uh, the way the thing is now. I mean, Soumya Swaminathan said that instead of pandemic, it's going to become endemic, which means you never get rid of it. It's always there, but it doesn't hit that many people. And when it does, it's not necessarily that serious. So people will take a little bit of precaution and get on with uh, their normal lives. And when that will be, one can't say, but you know, I think in vaccination, I mean, we are late and we're not up to target, but sooner or later we'll get there. I think it's probably reasonable to think that by 2022, uh, people will begin uh, to think that things are a bit normal, uh, unless of course you, you get a new pandemic, but right? that can never be ruled out. But so I think the pandemic is, uh, is a problem, but is less of a serious one. Climate change is going to be there for the next, whatever, 30, 40 years. I and mean, actually, it's going to be there. And if we don't tackle it, we won't be there. Uh, so that's a huge challenge, and I'll come to that. But there are two other things which uh, we have to keep in mind as we look at issues of policy. Uh, one of these is really uh, geopolitics. You know, the world has changed very dramatically from what it was uh, during the entire post-Second War period. I mean, that was the period uh, when there was really, uh, there were basically, I mean, two conflicting groups, the United States and the so-called market-based economies and the Soviet Union. And then the developing countries were all sort of, uh, not wanting to join any one of them. And that was the sort of non-aligned movement kind of thing. But you know, over time, that particular conflict sort of ended with the Soviet Union uh, self-destructing and virtually all of Eastern Europe abandoning communism. China remained communist, but a very different kind of communism from what there was uh, at the time of the Cold War. More like a state capitalism a very strongly nationalistic state capitalist economy. Uh, and the world has also changed because, you know, uh, the U.S. remains amongst the Western countries uh, the predominant economic power. Uh, but there's a very good chance that China will overtake it uh, within a few years in terms of GDP, not in terms of per capita GDP, but in terms of GDP. Uh, and while the United States has a huge lead in terms of military technology, uh, I think we are increasingly seeing, as you saw in what happened in Afghanistan, that controlling modern military technology doesn't actually enable you to project power. It certainly enables you to defend yourself. I mean, it would be a very foolish country 
that would try to attack the United States militarily, given its strength. But it's increasingly clear that for all its military strength, the U.S. cannot project its power in other parts of the world. And really, it can't unless it has sort of, if you like, boots on the ground. I mean, it helps to have a lot of uh, military equipment. But if you don't have boots on the ground, you really can't do very much. And that alters people's perspectives about geopolitics. And it certainly makes China uh, uh, much more uh, credible in projecting itself as the dominant power in the East Asian region that has implications for us. And we're, of course, surrounded by not very friendly uh, neighbors, uh, Pakistan to the west, beyond that, Afghanistan. We don't know how Afghanistan is going to move, but uh, at the moment is clearly a problem area. Iran, again, I mean, we, we have traditionally had reasonably good relations with Iran, but Iran is also beginning to uh, uh, slightly distance itself from us. Uh, and the whole of the Middle East is in a very uncertain kind of situation. Uh, so we're living in a tough world in which if we really want to protect ourselves, uh, we have to ensure that we can, uh, we can militarily hold our ground, at least not get pushed around too much. Uh, I think the third big change uh, with these global changes, there's a bit of rethinking uh, on economics itself in the sense that uh, the, great, uh, the great experience of the post-World War II period was that uh, the United States, as a, if you like, a benign power, actually helped the defeated countries to regain their strength. So it rebuilt Europe, it also rebuilt Japan. And it was accepted as uh, 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 the purveyor of what is sensible economic policy. And everybody basically said, look, that's the way to go. And that was essentially uh, much greater reliance on markets, much greater reliance on the private sector, much greater reliance on international trade, openness, and things like that. Now, you know, this has got eroded, uh, not because of us, but because of many, many other things that have happened. I mean, first of all, in the United States itself, you know, uh, the way uh, uh, the market economy has worked it has led to increased uh, inequality. That's also true in Europe, certainly true in, the, in America. Uh, and in Europe, uh, it's been responded to by a much more active redistributive uh, state in the sense that you accept the fact that uh, market economics will create inequality, but what the state does through a, a more sensible approach to taxation uh, uh, redistributes this income so that those at the bottom get a lot of public goods that they don't have to pay for. I mean, the most important public good is clearly health and education. And when I say health and education, I don't mean just basic health and education. I mean, what I think people need if they, if they are to tolerate inequality is that uh, you will actually get a good education may not have a luxurious education, but you get a good education so that if your kid is smart and willing to work hard, there's no reason to think uh, that the education he or she is getting will not enable them to get uh, to the top in a meritocratic world. And we are not providing that kind of education. In the primary education we provide through our government schools is hopelessly bad. And the education we provide through most of our universities is also hopelessly bad. I mean, you guys are, are belong to, at least when I was there, we used to call it an elite institution. I hope you're a little bit elite even now, although elite is not a good word anymore. But certainly, you, by, by no stretch of the imagination, are you the average uh, university experience in India. And I think the, the failure to deliver uh, a sufficiently good education to a sufficiently large number of people is something to worry about. I think the third thing that has really undermined a lot of uh, 
the current uh, or the traditional global consensus is somehow the belief that running an open economy is not actually very good for you. Now, I mean, if you go back to trade theory, uh, everybody knew that foreign trade is good for the country, but for the country as a whole. It has distributional effects where there are some winners, well, there are some big winners and some not so big winners, and there may even be some losers. So this horrible phrase, which my friends in the management, business management world have invented, a win-win situation, which in my view is complete rubbish. I mean, there's no such thing as a win-win situation. Any structural change, you know, affects some people more than others. And when it affects some people, when all it does is give more benefits to some than others, that's kind of manageable. When it starts hurting others, then it's a lot less manageable. Uh, and I think you have to do something about it. Uh, and you've got to have a, a strategy where those who are losing uh, feel that, look, there's enough in the system uh, which makes it good for them. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to support every job. I mean, you know, uh, a guy may be locked into a not very good paying job and the change in technology may cause that kind of job to lose value over time. But if new jobs are coming up, which gain a lot of, provide a lot of value, and if his kid is well enough educated to get those jobs, the person might feel, well, that's not so bad. You know, I'm just running a lousy rickshaw, but my son's a software engineer in Infosys, so the world is okay. And when I say Infosys, I mean TCS or any of I'm no, no special thing about Infosys. So I think one has, to, one has to have a granular look at what's actually happening uh, in, in a system. Uh, I remember that in the 19, the 2010s, in those days, you know, we used to focus on poverty. The perception was that, look, what's the use of economic growth when you have so many Indians living in poverty? And I think that was a legitimate concern. And we were all very concerned to say, well, look, this is the poverty line. Is the growth inclusive? And the definition of inclusive was that it will take a lot of people above the poverty line. Well, you know, as a matter of fact, it did between 2004, 2011. For the first time ever, 180 million people were pulled above the poverty line. Of course, in a democracy, it's good to be criticized. And so a lot of people say, well, what is this? The poverty line is all rubbish. It's too low. It should be higher. They, they, never, they never recognize that while that is objectively quite possible because it's an arbitrary thing, what's the poverty line? Even if you had raised the poverty line, the number of people below it would have, would have risen initially, but then would have fallen over time. But I think more, more importantly, uh, people began to also say that, look, it's not good enough uh, for me no longer to be poor. It's not enough to say to a person, uh, you have it much better than your parents did. Because if the standard is changing, and there are other people who are really transforming themselves, then people are not particularly happy just to be pulled about the poverty line. And I think one of the things that has happened with smartphones is that people's awareness of lifestyles around the world has really changed. When I say around the world, I mean in India. I mean, look, I have an iPhone, and I get all these advertisements by WhatsApps and so on. And, you know, I think I have a pretty decent sort of standard of living. But when I look at these ridiculous advertisements, it makes me feel that everybody else has a much better standard of living because they're advertising all kinds of luxury products. You know, it's interesting. If you, if you watch television in the United States, all the advertising is of what I would call median level goods, the kind of things that an average American can hope for. Most of our uh, advertisement is not about uh, medium level, median level consumer goods. It's about very high level consumer goods. And anyone watching these ads 
is bound to feel that, look, things may be going well for some people, but they're certainly not going well for me. Even if I have a much better food and my kids are educated and my kids are clothed and all the rest of it. So I think this, this question of whether the, whether the kind of growth we are experiencing is going to satisfy everyone, which is after all, that's the name of the game. That's a very real phenomenon. And, you know, we did some work on this. Uh, and, uh, you know, when liberalization uh, took place, we were aware that some states were going to end up doing better. Uh, simply because some of them were better located. I mean, states that were located near the ports were originally prevented from benefiting from uh, uh, openness to world trade because of our own policies. Uh, those policies never encouraged enough imports, didn't actually encourage export competitiveness. The moment you change that, uh, the guys who would be most able to adjust would they be the ones nearer the ports, not the ones in the hinterland. So clearly uh, there would be a kind of an unequal uh, expansion uh, in some states and not in others. Now, you, you have to offset that through other means uh, in order to make sure that everybody benefits roughly equally. Uh, and I think a broader definition of uh, inequality uh, is now needed. Uh, I mean, I, I see that more than half of you on the screen are women, which is really good. Uh, but one of the critical things today is gender inequality. I mean, uh, uh, this country's record on gender inequality is disgraceful. Uh, we're very proud of many things we do. We're very proud of our culture. But the fact is that uh, the participation rate of Indian women is far too low. So something is really wrong. And that's not because of economic policy. That's because of social policy and a whole lot of other things. But the point is we have to recognize that and then somehow try to correct it. So the challenges before us, I would say, uh, I'm not taking too long. And I'll violate my own rule that the whole idea was to get questions from you. So I, I will close in another five or six minutes. See, I think the challenges... It's not, it's clearly not enough to say, uh, no, let me, let me step back. Let me go back to the pandemic. You will see a lot of news saying we are having a V-shaped recovery. Uh, you know, please uh, put this in perspective. Uh, we got clobbered last year, 2021. I think today's newspapers go on and on about how uh, the economy has grown at 20%. But that's 20% over the same quarter of the previous year. And in the previous year, the, the quarter had dropped by 24%. So if you go to the first quarter of the year 1919-20, okay, as the base, then the first quarter of the year 2021, which was the last year's first quarter, dropped by 24%. So if 2019-20 uh, was 100, the first quarter in 2021 was actually 76%, 76, 24% growth. Now, if 76 goes up by 20%, that's an increase of from 76 to about 91. So we are actually still 9% below where we were in the year 2019-20. And since then, population has grown by whatever, two plus percent. So in per capita income terms, we're actually still significantly behind. My, my guess is that, you know, through this year, we will make up this difference. And by the time we enter the next year, which is 2022, during the year, we may well have grown by 8% or so, having fallen by 7.6% last year. That will only just bring us back to where we were in 2019-20. So I leave it to you to judge whether that's a V-shaped recovery or not. I mean, you know, one view of V-shaped recovery was big drop in the first quarter, bounding up uh, in the second and third and we would start this year, the current year, 
above where we were in 2019-20. That's clearly not what has happened. Uh, we did drop. We improved. But the year as a whole was a 7.3% drop. We're now beginning to improve. And my guess is that uh, we may grow by 8%. And, you know, left to itself, 8% looks impressive. But actually, that's only a, a recovery back to 2019-20. So the question you have to ask yourself is, when we get back to a normal position, which will be, let's say, at the start of the next financial year, what's going to be our growth rate? Will it be 8%, which may well be achieved this year? Or will we go back to what was the norm in the pre-pandemic period, somewhere between 4 and 5%? So I think the first challenge has to be uh, disregard the growth rate of the current year as nothing other than a revival and try to focus on whether, whether you think this growth rate is going to continue next year. If it is, wonderful. I mean, if we grow by 8% next year, I would call that really good. Uh, but, you know, if we grow at 4.5%, that's not very good. And in the year before the pandemic, we grew at a little over 4%. So that's challenge number one. And I think, to be fair to the government, the chief economic advisor uh, recently said that he thinks that from next year onwards, we should grow at 7%. I agree with that. But then he, one should measure performance. And I think by next June, he shouldn't be saying, well, you know, 4% is good enough, etc. We should measure, are we getting that? And if we're not getting that, why are we not getting that? Uh, what is it that we need to break out of the pre-pandemic growth rate? That's really the, the big question. But, you know, it's not just this 8%. It's also what I said, that we have to now start taking action on climate change. Um, I'm doing a paper on this, and uh, at some point you'll be able to check it out. It will be put on the website of the Center for Social and Economic Progress, where I am CSEP, where I am a distinguished fellow. So probably within a week it will be there. So those of you who want to know my views on climate change will find it there. But the bottom line is that we have to do a hell of a lot if you want to be serious about mitigating emissions in, the, in the, this country. And that is going to require a lot of tough decisions and a lot of investment. And you're going to get a revival of investment. And I don't think that investment is going to come from the public sector. So it's going to come from the private sector. So you've got to create an environment in which the private sector is willing to invest all that money. So that's a huge climate change related challenge. But, you know, one of the difficulties there is that in the whole climate change issue, I mean, for example, if you, if you want to reduce the use of polluting energy, you want to increase energy efficiency. And if you want to increase energy efficiency, you have to get rid of fuel subsidies. If you subsidize fuel, people are not interested in saving energy. And getting rid of fuel subsidies is a political hot potato. I mean, I'm not aware of any politician in the country, of any party, who's willing to say that we should get rid of fuel subsidies. So I think you have to ask yourself that, you know, if as economists you think it's necessary, let me say that, you know, the concern for the poor is a totally legitimate concern. But I would say that uh, you could say that the bottom 20% of the country is poor and you need to give them some support. So give them a direct cash support. But there's no reason for having subsidized energy pricing. I don't think you'll find enough people willing to take that line. Um, similarly, if we want to get away uh, from using carbon, coal, which is a highly, highly polluting fossil fuel, around the world people are saying that we should introduce a carbon tax that would internalize the social costs of using coal. Again, I don't think there's anybody willing to support that. One of the big problems with climate change is going to be water. Uh, we're going to have not necessarily less water, but we're going to have a much greater unpredictability and huge concentrations of rainfall, which lead to a lot of runoff. So the water doesn't seep into the ground. 
Basically, water scarcity will increase and higher temperatures will reduce productivity of the existing crops that we have. Now, how do we move towards more scientific application of water? Once again, if water is free and power is free in order to pump up water, why do we think that anyone will move to more rational use of water? I haven't seen any politician get, they all know it, by the way. I mean, I've talked to them and when I was deputy chairman, I would tell the states, but they just feel, no, Montez, we can't say this in public. So frankly, I, I would personally urge each one of you, when you meet with politicians, please ask them that if you are serious about climate change, are you serious about introducing rational energy pricing and rational water pricing? Or do you think you can do it without doing that? Now, you know, the answer is you can do it if you were to nationalize all water and ration it. I mean, if you, if you set up a system which said, look, you're still going to get the water free, but we are going to, the state is going to control all the water and all the pumps, and we are going to measure out per acre how much water you get, then you might be able to force farmers to realize that, look, you can't pump water out of the land anymore. You're only going to get so much, so you better learn how to use it economically. But I don't believe anybody is interested in doing that either. So really, how are we going to handle these are big, big kind of issue. A related issue which is coming up now, and that is the retreat from the notion that open trade is a good thing. Uh, you hear a lot of that. Uh, there is an increase in protectionism in the country. We have raised import duties on a whole lot of things, which actually reverses what was done by the 1991 reforms. I personally think this is a mistake, uh, and I think this will show itself up by reducing our competitiveness. Uh, but how do we address this issue? Uh, I think we need to we need to develop a consensus that uh, what is the role of protection uh, in moving to a sensible industrial policy? Uh, Big questions, in other words, and by the way, the last point that I want to make is that, you know, some people think that um, uh, the market is responsible for all these inequalities. It is true that uh, the digital economy has created a new kind of market. I mean, it's a market in which uh, the winner takes all. Uh, it's not a free market like a I mean, uh, the market for bakeries is a free market. I mean, any man or woman in his house can start baking bread. And I'm surprised at how many of them are doing it. Uh, and, you know, you get a huge variety of bread now from all over the, within the country, including exotic brands of bread like sourdough and Italian stuff and, you know, whatever. So that's, that's a market that doesn't lend itself to concentration. But many markets, especially in the digital economy, uh, size has an advantage. So the first, first mover becomes larger and larger, gets more and more customers, and ends up dominating. Now, what's the solution to that? I think the solution to that is you have a regulated market which tries to ensure competition. The solution to that is not that you go to the public sector. Uh, I mean, that would be the biggest mistake we can think of. So while I think there are serious problems with the private sector market economy, I think one of the issues that you guys have to make up your mind about is are you comfortable with the proposition that rapid growth in India will only take place if India is, adopts a private sector-led growth process, but with the state playing a very important role? And that role is more infrastructure, more education, more health uh, and, and, and better regulation to ensure competition. Uh, you know, unless we have an agreement on all these things, I don't think we can work out what the challenges are. I mean, right now the government has put out uh, a, a, a public asset monetization program and they're being criticized that, you know, you're selling the family silver, et cetera. 
Yeah, you've got to be clear. I mean, you know, do you believe that the public sector should hang on to all these things? Or is it better to sell them off and use the money to create new facilities? But unless we get an agreement on this, the debate becomes a little infructuous. Now, some of this debate in politics is good. I mean, it's not the job of the opposition to be constantly uh, drum beating for the government. It's good for the opposition to criticize the government on every point. But, you know, sometimes they get it wrong. What you need to decide is what are valid criticisms and what are not valid. So I don't know if this really addresses the kinds of issues that you all had in mind, but I think these are these are all these are the problem areas. And one other thing, as we move forward, you know, a very large number of things uh, are going to rest in the control of state governments and not the central government. I mean, the central government has the control of the national highways. It has the control over the railways. It has control over telecommunications. But, you know, it doesn't control power distribution, which is entirely in the hands of state government. It doesn't control non-national highways. And most of the highways, I mean, only about 3% of the highways are national highways. So 95% of road connectivity depends on state government roads. So the, and all of agriculture is in state governments. All of health is in state governments. All of education is in state governments. So if the state has to play a major role, which I think it does, it requires a phenomenal increase in the capacity of state governments. One of our problems is that most of our policy debates take place with the central government. Everybody loves debating with the central government. Uh, nobody wants to debate with state government. I mean, if anyone has, you know, all these national debates are directed at the central government, whereas many of them really should be directed at the state government. That is happening now a little bit. Uh, but I think we need to, we need to see how that's going to evolve. Uh, and this has also political implications in the sense that, you know, uh, the national government I suppose the national political leadership would want to participate in a state government election. But that participation should be based on what the state government has done. And if the state government belongs to the same party, they can say, well, what a wonderful job they've done. If it belongs to another party, they can say, what a lousy job. But I don't think that the national government policies should be an issue in state elections because the national government should be supporting all states equally. But we are very far uh, from that kind of uh, world. And I think that's, that's something in the next 10, 20 years you all have to think about. Anyway, with those words, let me thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to your questions. So we would really like to thank you for your time in giving this lecture. Before we By move way, on, are all the women on the screen from St. Stephen's College? Well, are all the women from St. Stephen's College? Raise your hands if you are. One, two, three, four. That's the other big change from when I was in college. It was actually not co-educational. So we missed out big time. Okay, go ahead. Before we move on to the question answer session, we would really like to thank our faculty members, Professor Poonam Kalra, Professor Somali Ghosh, and Professor Benston John. Thank you for your time and for your presence in this meeting. If there are any questions, please leave them in the chat box. If you would like to unmute and speak, please raise your hand and you will be called out. I believe we have a question from our faculty member, Ms. Somali Ghosh. Ma'am, please go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, the hand got raised by mistake. I'm sorry. All right, ma'am. Uh, so, sir, so we have... Ma'am, please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, so my question is, you know, a question which I want you to answer for our own students here. 
like all of them, 20 to 24. So 20 years from now, can, it was can the topic. Can you speak closer to the mic? Because I can't hear you. I'm Probably so because sorry. my hearing aid isn't good enough. Oh, I'll, I'll repeat myself. Yeah. So my question is, uh, you know, from the point of view of the students here, you know, aged 20s, uh, am I audible? Yeah, it's more audible now. I brought my laptop closer also. Okay. So, so the question really is that, are they going to enjoy the same fruits of their labor as our generation has? Like, you know, especially my generation, because, uh, you know, I, I joined college in 1990. So that was the most exciting time. You know, uh, reforms were happening. A lot of opportunities were made available and we made hay. Like we may made the best of the opportunities. So 20 years from now, will this generation uh, be better off than us? I mean, not in really in terms of technology, in terms of the, the economy as a whole. Will they be living in a better space uh, than we are right now? Uh, and if there are, you know, special challenges only for the next 20 years, you know, only for this generation? Uh, yeah. No, it's a very good, very good question. I mean, I, I'm a congenital optimist. I mean, uh, as an economist, I came back to India um, tracking up my rather well-paid job in the World Bank way back in 1979. When, uh, can you just hold on a second? Hi, Gulji. Can I call you back? I'm on a Zoom call. Um, I was quite convinced that India is not going to continue with the stupid policies that we had in place and that I wanted to do my little bit to push it forward. That's all written about in my book, which I somewhat uh, shamelessly displayed on the screen. And I have to say, by the way, that I wasn't the only person who thought change was possible. It would not have been possible if I was the only one. There was a surprisingly large number of people. So I would just hope that the president, I have no reason to believe that India's march forward will be interrupted. I just hope that this generation keeps its mind and eyes open uh, and keeps questioning <coughs> received wisdom. If we had continued to question received wisdom, <coughs> you wouldn't have had the opportunities that you got. So by all means, question received wisdom. And one of the received wisdoms is, should you run an open economy? I mentioned that. I personally think you should. But there's a role for strategic support in critical areas. But you've got to learn from the horrendous mistakes we made in the past. I think it was the American philosopher George Santayana who said, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. So you want to avoid that. Uh, and, you know, by and large, look at what other successful countries are doing. And for us, looking at other successful countries doesn't mean looking at China because China is not like India. It doesn't have the diversity of India. It doesn't have the plurality of India. So my view, this is a prejudice, my view is that democratic environment, which is constantly questioning things and, you know, providing room for dissenting views is more essential for India than it is for other countries. So therefore, I mean, you know, we, we need to create an environment where received wisdom is constantly challenged. Policy is subjected to evidence-based analysis. And you know, this can be, this can sometimes be very controversial. I mean, let's, let's take an unpolitical thing, uh, uh, rice fortification, for example. It's surprising how many, I mean, I know nothing about it. And when I was in the planning commission, I tended to think that, look here, if you're doing nutritional fortification, what's wrong with that? And a lot of people said, no, no, this is just some kind of a capitalist plot because they want to move you away from natural food to processed food. I thought, yeah, maybe that's, that's an issue. But now you have scientists saying, that the notion that you can take care of nutritional deficiencies by fortifying food is wrong. 
I mean, you need a diversified food basket. But fortification is wrong. Now, th this is not something that an economist knows anything about. But there are lots of cases in our own history where we've had differences. I mean, the success of the polio program was very crucially dependent on getting agreement on the nature of the polio vaccine that would do the job. And there were differences of view. So, you know, at all times, there are differences. Now, frankly, I think one of the big problems today is that um, there are differences of view even amongst physicists at a deep kind of level. So after a while, you know, merely, sell it, merely riding on differences doesn't make sense. I mean, you have to note what's happening, take a good look, and see if it works. Uh, but you've got to keep checking to make sure that it works. And I mean, many, you know, one of the interesting things about India is that many micro examples of effort actually work. Uh, and this, the, the lesson to draw from that is that centralized direction is not necessarily a good thing. Now, this has the implication, which uh, most uh, the babus in the center, like myself, I mean, I was also one of these, you know, we've read everything, we've talked to people, we know, etc. The truth of the matter is that the danger with a centralized system is that when you get it wrong, you get it horribly wrong because you just change everything for everybody. The advantage of a decentralized system is that different guys are doing different things. And so if you allow more decentralization, I mean, in those subjects where decentralization can work, you may find that some people succeed and others don't, and you can learn from that, you know? So I think uh, I, I, would, I would say that uh, um, in the, uh, in the social, social sciences, uh, as long as the youth of today uh, relentlessly go for evidence-based analysis, in deciding what's good and not good, uh, I think we're okay. Of course, the government on its part has to also acknowledge that and provide room for such feedback to take place. But that will happen. I mean, I don't, I don't think it won't. So short, the short answer is, look, uh, it's not that we're going to become the world's richest power. But by the time these kids are my age or even your age, uh, but certainly by the time they're my age, uh, we should have become at the top of the middle income group of countries. So a lot of what we have traditionally worried about, malnutrition, poverty, kids in school who can't read, this, that, and the other, this will have gone. Uh, but, you know, whether we will produce a society that is buzzing and generating enough optimism to keep going or with conflicts that it is unable to resolve and therefore fighting with each other, that's really an open question. And there are lots of, I mean, there are many issues that will come up. I mean, for example, in 2026, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but in 2026, uh, the next, uh, the, whatever the commission that, determines the number of seats in parliament uh, will meet. And for years, we've held, we've treated population as fixed at the 1991 level. If we were to decide to update our population to by then, let's say the 2021 census, which would be 30 years after the last one, you can be sure that the number of seats that in parliament that will go to the northern states will be much higher than the number of seats that will go to the southern states. And those states could legitimately say, and I know they are saying, listen, we are disciplined, we control population, you fellows breed like rabbits, and why should you get so much power politically uh, for actually having mucked it up? I don't know how you solve this problem. So some very delicate balancing will become necessary. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Panjal Gautam, you may go ahead and ask your question. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, we are saying that we are saying that in this uh, suppose suppose COVID phase, there are numerous students who are devoid of education. So, sir, what is your plan or what we should do to bring them back into the cycle of education? Well, it's a, it's a very serious, it's a, a genuinely a very serious problem. I, mean, I think what COVID has done, it has uh, shone the light on the inherent inequality in the system. You know, in the sense that, look, uh, I, I belong, I suppose, to a somewhat privileged class. I mean, I have three grandchildren right next to me, ranging in age from seven, seven and nine and 11. Now, these kids are, they haven't been to school for the last year, but they each have a computer. They're each very connected. They each do their uh, classes online and their parents have hired for them uh, tutors who can make up the difference. Uh, and it costs them some money, but they're willing to do it. So my judgment is that these kids will not be influenced, adversely affected at all. On the other hand, I mean, you know, we know that something of the order of 70% of the children uh, do not have the kind of access that would even allow a minimal type of online activity. I mean, you may have a smartphone in the house, but if you have one smartphone and your father needs it and your mother needs it, you can't necessarily do your classes online on the basis of that smartphone. Uh, and secondly, you know, for very young children, uh, probably you, we're overloading these children anyway. So I firmly believe that if those of you who have cousins or nephews or something who are less than 10 years old and their parents are going nuts, uh, how is he going to get into or how is she going to get into IIT? Tell them to relax uh, because mugging up in the last two or three years is what's necessary as long as they're growing up as good, sensible kids and can read and write and do arithmetic, uh, they should be okay. But you know, for kids who are currently 15 and working towards their board exam, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a mess. And I don't have an easy answer to this. I mean, this is a scar that will stay. And particularly it will stay in a world in which labor is not scarce. I mean, in the sense that there are enough people uh, in uh, pre-COVID educated people who don't have jobs and somebody coming out of the COVID period, just entering the labor force with less skills is going to lose out. Um, frankly, uh, major efforts need to be made to do supplementary teaching uh, to to bring them up to scratch. But you know, how, how effectively we can do that, I mean, it's all connected with the quality of, uh, uh, of our educational system. So I, I, I mean, that's, that is a problem and it's not easy to take care of it. It may not affect GDP very much huh? because uh, uh, there are enough uh, qualified people from the earlier cohort who haven't got jobs uh, but what will happen is the cohort that is affected will probably lose out significantly uh, for an extended period of time. Thank you so much, sir. So our next question is by Saurabh Chetri. There have been reading a book backstage and there is a qu and they have a problem from the phrase that you've written, something that seems to confuse them. Okay. The, phrase, the phrase, and I quote, China is a closed economy with an open mind and India is an economy with a closed mind. And uh, end quote. The question is, do you believe India is still an open economy with closed mind or do you believe it's quite the opposite now? Well, I mean, it's a good, very good point. Um, I, I think uh, uh, when I said earlier that we were a closed, uh, China was a closed economy with an open mind. Actually, that phrase is owed to my wife. 
because she's the one who gave it to me because she had visited China and discussed with a lot of people. And I think she was is, is correct. Uh, the Chinese ran a closed economy, and I, I mentioned that in backstage, how much discussion the Chinese had with other people to find out how they should change. And, you know, the general view is that the Chinese have a pretty low opinion of India because they're so much ahead of us. But they, they recognize that in some areas we were ahead of them. And one of them was in the building of a capital market and the other one was in software. And the Chinese actually sent teams to India to talk to our people in SEBI and went to Infosys to talk to them in order to sort of learn how come these fellows who can't run a decent railway system can run a decent capital market. So that's a very open mind. I mean, the idea of an Indian, let's say going to Bangladesh to learn something is just implausible. And yet there's a lot we could learn from Bangladesh. They're doing better than us in many areas. I remember Manmohan Singh saying that to the Bangladesh minister because they had started trade liberalization before we did. And he said to him, you know, I know you're doing that. How is it going? And so I think we need, we need to do much more of this. Are we now an open economy with a closed mind? You know, I, I think we don't have, we, we don't have enough uh, debate and discussion. I mean, what Isha was describing was before the economic reforms, where we were quite unwilling to rethink our policies. Now, frankly, after 1991, uh, we did rethink our policies. So we weren't that closed. Uh, are we today in a sufficiently open, uh, with a sufficiently open mind? We have to wait and see. But the most important thing is really, what do young people think? Because those are the minds that are going to affect the future. Not all these older people sitting in government offices uh, who, are, who naturally uh, are self-important because they have important jobs. But what do younger people think? If younger people all kind of adopt a kind of a, 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 a standard routine, then we will become a closed society. But if they don't, and I think that's where listening to the private sector but the great advantage of a private sector economy is that you're forced to listen to a multiplicity of people. And that brings out the conflicting nature uh, of policy. I mean, let me give you one example. Uh, right now, you're seeing a lot of discussion on e-commerce. Is it good? Are we doing the right thing? Is that That's so interesting. I mean, you've got e-commerce. You've got the Kirana stores very unhappy with all these e-commerce fellows. You've got uh, Amazon and Walmart sort of coming in from outside, bringing state-of-the-art sort of technologies, but also, uh, if you like, uh, manipulative ways of pushing consumer choice one way or the other. You've got Indian uh, uh, participants uh, in e-commerce who have their own angle, so I think one one needs to one needs to sort of one needs to examine every policy on a what I would call a key bono principle. Who benefits? Key bono means who benefits. And the fact is that when there are many stakeholders, only careful analysis will tell you what is the interest of each different stakeholder. And then, in my view, once this is made broadly clear. I think you will end up with a much more balanced outcome. And people modify their own positions when they know that the other side uh, is being heard. Thank you, sir. So would you be willing to accept two or three more questions? Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. All right, sir. So our next question is from Nanil Jain. They would like to know if the present stock market surge is a true reflector of the promise of economic growth. Yeah, and that is not a question I want to answer because I don't want anyone to make a decision on the stock market because of what I think. Actually, my uh, I will just quote, go back to quoting to you Keynes, 
who had the best uh, example of stock markets. The stock markets depend not on reality, but what other people think is reality. And he referred to uh, these beauty contests that used to be run in those newspapers of the 30s, where they would have five photographs of, I suppose this is not a gender sensitive remark, so the ladies will forgive me, they'll have five beautiful women and everybody would be asked to vote who's the most beautiful. And in the end, the person deemed to be the most beautiful was the one who got the maximum votes and that will be announced in the next week or something. And Keynes pointed out that, you know, the name of the game here is not to decide who's the most beautiful objectively. The name of the game is to decide who do most people think is the most beautiful. And that's what the stock market is all about. And if everybody thinks that a particular stock is a winner, that stock is going to go through the roof. So if you want to pick a stock, pick a stock where you think everybody else is going to jump on and jump on before they do. Jumping on it after they've jumped on is a bad idea because then it's actually ready to fall. So anyway, having said that, uh, if any of you decide to invest in a stock, please remember it's not because of anything I've said. However, it is generally known that when you run a loose monetary policy and everybody in the world now is running a loose monetary policy, there's a tendency for asset prices. The loose money goes into assets and assets usually means houses and stocks. So these things tend to get inflated. And then when you tighten money supply, the demand froth goes out of this market and the prices come down. But you know, it's very, it's very difficult to predict that. You, you, it's not easy at all. So uh, there you are. Thank you, sir. So our next question is from Matilda Ribeiro. I'm terribly song if I, I'm terribly sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. So referring to something you said earlier, they're asking that you said that technology and interventions to combat climate change are more likely to come from the private sector. Would you agree with the idea put forth by Jeremy Refkin that this Who? Jeremy Refkin, Rifkin, uh -huh. Jeremy Rifkin, that this would be incentivized by the zero marginal cost of renewable energy. And how long do you think it would take to reach this point? Well, you know, uh, renewable energy has zero marginal cost, but it has very high capital costs. So uh, to set up a renewable energy plant, you have to be able to cover the capital costs. Uh, but once you've set it up, I mean, using it for more energy or less is maybe less important. You know, the biggest thing with renewable energy is intermittency. I mean, solar energy is there during the day, it's not there during the night. So you, you can't run a grid with, with energy sources that have variable supply. So in order to do that, you have to balance the different sources of supply. And maybe you have to put in a lot of batteries which take up the uh, solar energy at peak and release it uh, when uh, solar energy production is low. And that adds to costs. So a lot of this is examined in this paper that I've done. So uh, a week from now, uh, just go to the website of the CSEP and uh, look for a working paper by me and a colleague called Utkarsh Patel uh, on uh, the challenge of managing climate change. And you'll find a lot of stuff in that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our final question for the night is by Tanya Mittal. They would like to ask, what are the structural issues, what are the structural issues facing Indian economy that need to be dealt for India's inclusive growth? Well, that's a good, good question. Uh, look, the structural issues, I think, uh, which I think are clearly uh, doing a better job on health and education is absolutely crucial. I mean, it's crucial 
for two reasons. I mean, one is that uh, better health and better, better education are end products of development. And so, I mean, if you, the reason you want to live in a developed society is you want better health and you want better education for its own sake. In addition to that, better health and better education increase the productivity of labor. So not only does it make you a better, more satisfied citizen, it actually makes you more productive. So how to, how to ensure that in this dimension of human capability, we keep improving? And incidentally, improving here has to include the gender balancing issue also. This is a big, big, really big issue. Uh, and uh, I mean, one can, the many ways in which many things you have to do uh, to reach that solution. But I do feel that uh, between the central government and the state government, uh, the ratio of responsibility probably is 2080. I mean, 80% uh, of what needs to be done has to be done by state governments. One of the interesting conclusions of that is that since we have so many different states, it must be the case that some states will do better than others. And so we need to learn from the states that are doing better uh, so that the states that are not doing well uh, 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 get a sense that, look, we're just not up to the mark. So that's one, one area of structural. But the second area really is uh, 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 public resources. You know, uh, to run a good uh, private sector-based uh, high-growth society, you need a lot more of infrastructure, uh, most of which, not all of it, but most of which has to come from the government. And you also need a, a, a very big sort of governmental effort in improving the quality of regulation, ease of doing business, those kinds of things, P particularly for a modernizing economy. I mean, look, today... If you ran a business and somebody else uh, cheated you or violated a contract and you are told that, well, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do. It'll take 20 years in the courts. That's one kind of situation as opposed to you ran a business and you were told, well, if they've done something wrong, take them to the courts and it'll be solved in one year. I think we need to move to that one year. You know, the IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court, uh, is a very good reform, and it's a reform done by this government. But it's kind of got stuck because uh, there are a million ways in which the objective of the legislation can be diverted by owners and courts, uh, whether they're in cahoots or not. We don't know whether the courts understand the issue or not. We don't know. But I'm reasonably hopeful that it's taking place and it'll work. But to my mind, if the IBC is actually made to work and if uh, commercial disputes in courts are resolved much faster than they are, we will have taken a big step forward. That's one thing. Second, you know, the government has to do a larger job, both in education, health, infrastructure and defense. You know, frankly, we are spending now less than 2% of GDP on defense. And I think for a long time, we've kind of really assumed that, uh, you know, we don't need to do all of that, but we're living in a, a world in which uh, uh, we may have to spend more. Now, at the same time, the central government is borrowing too much. It's squeezing out the private sector. So how, how does the central government reduce its borrowing and also increase its expenditure. It requires a fiscal turnaround in terms of resources or saving expenditure, which is not very uh, productive, uh, which usually means a lot of useless subsidies, etc., which are being done politically. So that's a very big structural uh, problem. I mean, people wrongly think that India is overtaxed. India is not overtaxed. The ratio of taxation to GDP in India, center and states together, is about 16%. Whereas most people think for our level of GDP per capita, it should be 21%. Uh, 
Now, how are we going to get this extra five? Maybe half of this should come to the center, half of this should come to the states. It requires a major reform of the tax collection system. I think historically, we used to think that low tax rates are the most important ways of encouraging tax compliance. But we have low tax rates. Our corporate tax is now quite low. Our personal income tax also is not all that bad. And we don't have any inheritance tax, which many, many countries do. So we, I have said on a number of occasions that uh, it would be a good idea for the government to appoint a, a really an expert committee on tax reform for the next 10 years. This cannot be done through budgets. You know, I know how budgets are made. I mean, three months before the budget, the revenue department puts together a whole bunch of things. Lots of people send them proposals. They sift them and come up with a budget. In 1991, Dr. Manmohan Singh, sort of recognizing the importance of this, in that budget did nothing on taxation. Actually, he raised a tax. But he said, I'm setting up an expert committee under Raja Chale, who was then the most distinguished fiscal economist of the country, with some top accountants and experts and what have you, and said, look, why don't you give us some recommendations on what we should do? Well, I think maybe it's time to have another similar committee today. And, and these committee reports should be put out and discussed so that, you know, you can have a debate on them. Oh, I, I, sorry, I should have said banking. I think the, uh, this is another controversial subject. Uh, uh, let me reveal my prejudice right at the start. I don't think that state-owned banks in India are a good idea. They invariably get used by the government to meet whatever objectives it has. The bank managers listen to the finance ministry uh, and you see the results. I mean, all Indian banks have had problems, but the public sector banks have had much bigger problems. A lot of uh, fuss has been made about frauds and all in private sector banks. They've been true. So that management failures have been there, but those are very small in number. They haven't damaged the bank. And fortunately, the system has identified people who haven't done the right thing and they've been removed. Now, it's, look at it this way. In the last 15 years, no top manager of a public sector bank has been removed. Although the damage done to the balance sheets of the public sector banks is five to six times what it is to the private sector banks. So I think Privatizing the banking system or making it genuinely independent of government uh, would be a good thing. Now, the present government has said <clears throat> that they want to do that. <clears throat> Let's see what they do. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I would, I would now like to hand over to Vriti Batra for the vote of thanks. Good evening to everyone present here. On behalf of the Economic Society, St. Stephen's College, I deem it a great honor and privilege to extend my heartiest thanks to our revered speaker, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, who bestowed us with his insightful information about the economic challenges that will confront India for the next 20 years. I am sure everyone... Oh, is enlightened by his knowledge and presence. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our principal, Professor John Verghese, and Bursar, Dr. Renish Abraham, who gave us this opportunity to organize this sagacious lecture as a part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mohotsav, commemorating the 75th year of India's independence. I would also like to uh, deeply thank our sta staff advisor, Ms. Poonam Kalra, for her constant support and mo motivation in all our endeavors. Unfeigned thanks to our audience for their active participation. Thank you everyone for joining today and we hope you had a great experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Sir, could you stay for a photograph?